and I do have Tara behind me to support me. So everything should go really well, I think. Stand in the middle of your mat, <clears throat> probably without a bell on it, with your feet together if possible. Some reasons which would dictate it not being possible would include the thighs meeting before the feet, then you wouldn't bring your feet together. Your feet being uncomfortable to be touching, or if you're pregnant. Otherwise, if those, none of those things are affecting you, then feet together. If they are apart, they should be parallel, they should be level. The arms by <clears throat> the sides, the chest buoyant, the tummy lightly toned, that keeps the lower back muscles longer. Imagine being pulled up by the crown of your head and imagine being happy to be here. Imagine, for instance, you were upstairs at the Brighton Buddhist Center and there was soft sunshine coming in and a soft breeze and it was the weekend and it was August coming up late tomorrow, next day, soon, Monday. So, you know, look for lightness and happiness, santosha in Sanskrit, and play a little. So playing might mean lifting up each foot and landing it, might mean letting the body bear, move this way or that way. We look for lightness mentally, physically, respiritually. So light, uh, think of a dandelion seed when I say light. Right? There's a word in Sanskrit for it, which is lagu, L-A-G-H-U, lagu, light. Right? So light means unencumbered. Unencumbered means empty of karma. Being empty of karma is, uh, is selfless action. Selfless action is yoga. Uh, raise your arms up. That was a whole summary of yoga uh, forever and ever. Hi, morning. Raising the arms, soft neck, light tone in the tummy, breathing through your nose. Finding the pelvic floor, which you can range around to do. Uh, so everyone has a pelvic floor, of course. You can range around to do it. By the way, there are some more of the light blue mats. If you haven't got a light blue mat, or the purple one's good that you've got, but these light blue ones are better than the dark blue ones. Uh, there are some more downstairs, which I'll grab in a minute before the other group uh, goes in that room. Anyway, roots the neck, soft tummy toned, find the pelvic floor, playing, looking for lift, looking for space, looking for height. Press your feet, raise your fingers on the inhalation. On the exhalation, bend ankles, knees, and hips, and there's cracking sounds, which I always very much enjoy. And you can <laughs> bounce, or you can move it organically. The idea, of course, some people will tell you yoga is 5,000 years old. I can't say it isn't, but there's no evidence to say that it is, either apart from uh, the so-called Pashupati seal from Harappa, the Harappan culture, that is, uh, from Mohenjo-Dara, the town called Mohenjo-Dara, and that seal looks like someone meditating. That's it. That's the only evidence we've got that yoga is 5,000 years old. Personally, I think something like yoga probably is, but it's just speculation. But the point is the poses are not, not even 100 years old, most of them. <laughs> but the principle of flow is you don't find in any yoga text this pose described that your arms must be straight or this or that or the other. But you do say, you do find that the yogi moves into absorption through, through, often through the breath. Okay, stand up. Big circle, hands to heart, deep breaths that I can hear. So let a few deep breaths come and go. So that's stirring the pot, as it were. If you imagine your whole body as a sort of pot, like a pot of porridge. <laughs> and sometimes in porridge, you get lumps. So in our bodies and minds, which are the same thing, you get lumps, areas which we get stuck on, areas where there's no flow or less flow. In yoga, they're called gruntis, and grunty means knots. Interlace your fingers. So when your breath flows, you stir the pot, the gruntis get stirred out, energy flows. That basically means you're not getting obsessive about particulars. Stretch your arms diagonally down. Raise your arms up and about three quarters of the way up, avoid impingement of the uh, upper and middle fibers of the trapezius by moving your head and anything, just intuition, pratipa. It means intuition or intimates intuition. So pratipa, the inner light, and just trust it, play with it. You know, sometimes we've been to yoga classes, I'm sure, where the teachers have told us yoga's like this and it's not like that. And if you get long enough in the tooth, you'll go to another class and they say the opposite thing. Another yoga teacher says, 
the opposites of the other yoga teacher you'd been to, uh, but with as much confidence and you, you know, eventually you realize, hang on a minute, <laughs> you know, I better look at the texts, see what they say. <laughs> And they talk about flow, they talk about being free of knots, nirgranta. They talk about absorption, they talk about the goddess. So absorption is absorption in this experience, in all its richness, beyond thinking. Take a big circle to release, so keep the play going, well done, hands to hips and deep breaths. With your hands on your hips, your collarbones are wide, your chest is lifted. It's a confident position, isn't it? It's not a position most of us take unless we really mean business. We don't tend to stand talking to people with our hands on our hips, I don't think, unless we really mean business. So that's good. We really mean business. Huh? Step your feet generously apart. Just check your toes are equidistant from the front of the mat. And with your hands still on your hips, because it keeps your collarbones broad, find the pelvic floor. Now, uh, perhaps sometimes we hear an instruction like find the pelvic floor, and it could be that we get a bit unsure, a bit unconfident, a bit uncertain. We think that we're supposed to grip, grasp, or grab. But actually finding the pelvic floor is a relaxed, incredibly relaxed, everyone has a pelvic floor. So that's the first thing to say. There's nothing to worry about. Do I have one? And one person did approach me at the end of a class once and did say, do men have pelvic floors? He said to me, and I was like, I should hope so. Otherwise, it'd be a tremendous mess on the floor of all your intestines falling out. <laughs> pelvic floor are the muscles between your pubic bone and tailbone. So far, we have them, so nothing to worry about there. <laughs> so tuning in on them, but they're a living reality. Like all muscles, muscles are connected to the nerves. The nerves are connected to the way you breathe. The breath is connected to the way you think. So tuning in is a relaxed, uh, lovely, actually, a lovely feeling where there is play allowed. I'm sort of uh, playing, to tune in, to just feel the awakeness. It's not a gripped feeling. Now turn your left toes in, left toes in, and turning on the ball of the right foot and finishing off the turn on the heel of heel to arch alignment. So have a look at that, double check that that's happened for you. And of course, in the room in real life, I'm able to also scan through and double check that you've got heel to arch alignment. So I'm doing that now. So double check yourself because nobody likes anyone to tell them off. And so double check. Oh God, okay, great. I'm not gonna get told off. So raise your arms up. Breathe through your nose. Now focus on your inner groin of the back leg. The inner groin of the back leg. There's a muscle, there's two muscles, the iliacus and psoas, come from the inner thigh across the lateral pubis, eventually into the sides of the lower spine. Focus on that inner thigh area getting lighter and lifting by playing with the awareness and, and pressure on your back foot. So you can roll back and forth. And we're looking for a point where you can feel softness and lift mental softness and emotional softness. And we're going to lift that inner groin as we lean back. Don't hold your breath. Try and relax and have a nice morning. <laughs> Exhaling when you're ready. Come down. Keep a sense of soft psychophysical openness in that groin. Windmill up your top arm. Look up if you want to. Some of you might not want to because there's a horrible pure blue sky to have to look at, how awful. So you might not want to look at that. <laughs> We're breathing deep, jaw soft, play. Again, don't hold it like a statue. You'll find precisely no mentions of Trikonasana in any yoga text, none. <laughs> and even this instantiation was clearly invented, firstly by Krishnamacharya, and then by his semi-student, BKS Iyengar. They together, well, not in the same room at the same time, but one after the other, added things that make it like this. That's not to say that you can't practice yoga in it. You can. It's a great pose. You do that by breathing into it and playing with it. So relaxing into aliveness. Relaxing into aliveness. Okay, inhale, come up. Hands on the hips, feet face forward, breathe through your nose. Take some deep breaths. Turning your back toes in while breathing deeply. Front foot and leg out on the ball of the foot, finish off the turn on the heel. 
heel to arch alignment. Parallel instep. Now you might think if this pose is not so ancient, why are you so uptight about all this parallel alignment, foot alignment, blah, blah, blah. Well, it matters and it doesn't matter. Uh, uh, we can talk about why it matters and why it doesn't matter in a minute. Stretch your arms, breathe through your nose, focus on the inner groin of the back leg. So I have a saying, <laughs> calmness conditions connection. So if you want to connect to the inner groin, be calmer. The calmer you are, the more happy you are, the more contented you are, the more your nerves open up like fern leaves uncurling in the spring. Inhale, focus on the inner groin, exhale, come down. It's a pelvic movement. We want to feel internal <clears throat> spaciousness in that inner groin. Don't hold your breath. Do soften your eyes. Have your palm down on your shin. Relax the jaw. Let the breath be expressive. Yeah. Imagine you were giving yourself to this. Sometimes you give yourself to something gently and slowly. Other times you give yourself totally and all at once. It doesn't matter which way. Imagine you're giving yourself to this. Good. Windmill your arm down. We're not coming up, we're coming down. Both hands on the floor. Externally rotate your back heel and step your front foot backwards. Having done so, pat your paws into a deeper weave. We're in Adomokashwanasana, downward facing dog. Really get your palms to bed into the mat. I'm just going to see if there's any more of those better mats. Open the armpits, inner armpit, outer armpit. How did the energy change when I was out of the room? <laughs> and how has it changed now that I'm back in the room? Huh? Open the armpits a little bit more. Breathe as if you're enjoying your morning. It is Saturday. It is a seaside town. Yoga is pleasant. <laughs> okay, well done. Coming down to a regular kneeling position. If you were slipping, I brought up some other mats here, including my own personal secret weapon. My very own mat that I bought myself from Boots for, for, for five pounds about 19 years ago. So I put my, uh, that, that's my own secret weapon. It's one of the least slippy mats and then some other mats there in case you are slipping. We're sitting up in a kneeling position. It's called Vajrasana. Uh, there's a Vajra on the roof up there. If you've not seen a Vajra before, that's a crossed Vajra. That's two Vajras, one crossed over the other. Sorry, you can't see that, that at home. Catching your breath, jaw soft. If you need a block between the heels and buttocks, you should take it. So deep breaths, honest breaths. Great, good. <laughs> okay, from here we're coming onto our hands and knees and from there we're gonna stretch one leg back. Very simple. Breathing through the nose, just play with that stretch. So play has a purpose. So I've come up with about 10 little formulas that between the 10, I think you've got everything sort of zip filed up that you need to know about yoga. And one of them is play, purpose, and signs. Lila, Arta, Lakshana. Play is movement, obviously. Movement that has a purpose. That's the second part. The purpose is absorption. So knowing that the movement we're making has a purpose of absorption changes the way that we move, if we know why we're moving. Signs are the signs that you are absorbed. They include feeling absorbed, <laughs> obviously. 
may also include a sense of confidence massively increasing a sort of natural unassuming internal confidence they also include the breath becoming much more easy expressive and open so playing back and forth like that swap which leg is back which leg is forward similarly use your breath as your compass to tell you which way to move and how to move and when to move your breath as i said is part of the signs that indicate absorption and we do need to really sort of affirm that we're becoming absorbed because the human brain is very capable of thinking something and then somehow thinking it's true because you thought it you know like just because you think it it doesn't mean it's true but if you breathe it <laughs> then it is true so playing back and forwards any way that feels breath opening because we're all very good at, at kidding ourselves we're brilliant at, brilliant at it but the breath cannot be fooled okay both knees forwards catch your breath just get yourself comfortable Perhaps there's a bit of movement intimating looseness, breath-centered looseness. So breath-centered looseness means that the breath is quite clearly open, free-flowing, expressive, just as if you'd had a stressful day and you'd got in and it went okay, better than you thought perhaps. You got into your house, you put your keys wherever they need to be, and you collapsed in the sofa, knowing that no one else is at home for a while. <laughs> You just breathe out a few deep breaths. That's the way yoga should feel. Now, both legs back. This is sometimes called Kumbhakasana, sometimes called Palankasana. So Palankasana uh, means the plank. Kumbhakasana, Kumbhaka means a pot. And you're sloping from shoulder blades to buttocks and from buttocks to heels, but not holding it static. So if you range around, then you don't build up too much lactic acid and the muscles can sustain the posture longer. Don't let the buttocks float up as if feel, filled with helium and neither let your pelvis sag because a saggy pelvis is not something anyone wants on their CV. So just keep, keep, keep in a straight line, and breathe easy, well done. Just drop one knee, you deserve a break, just drop one knee but not very much, just, just to touch the floor. It's not much of a break, is it? Sorry. So maybe the other knee will be more helpful if you drop that one. So bring that other one up. Okay, and then both back up again, and then both knees forwards and sitting in your kneeling position. One hand on top of the other. Don't forget a block between the heels and buttocks if your knees are tight. If you place one hand on top of the other, you could be in Dhyana Mudra, also known as Dhyani Mudra, such as this Buddha picture has here. Uh, more traditionally, the thumb tips touch. Uh, depends on what tradition you're talking about. Particularly, actually, that's often portrayed in the Japanese tradition, thumb tips touching. So this uh, Dhyana or Dhyani just means meditation. In Chinese, the word is Chan. In Japanese, uh, the word is Zen or Zazen. And it just indicates meditation. So what is meditation? <laughs> is it me, but with better thoughts? You know, is it, what is it? Well, if you've ever been kissed on the cheek by someone you like, <laughs> that moment is meditation. If you've ever smelt the smell of a rose for a moment and there's only been rose in your universe for that moment of inhalation that's meditation if you've ever swum up what i call a sun road in the sea you get those lines the straight line leading to the sun as it were and the sunset if you're swimming in the sea that's meditation in other words meditation is absorption so here, absorption is absorption of what into what. 
the independent experience into the interdependent experience. In other words, instead of this idea of me doing yoga, the me and the body and the breath and the skin and the nerves and the emotions and the attitude are all part of one dance that's further interdependent with everything else, you know, so it's it's a surrender into the reality of interdependence. Now release uh, your hands and stretch your legs out. If you're near the front of the Buddhist center, so you three are near the front, just turn around 180 degrees. Uh, everyone else, you can stay just as you are. Stretch your legs out, put your hands behind your head as if you are in a relaxed mode, as if you're on holiday. And then when I'm on holiday, I like to put my feet up. So you might want to do the same. So you just lean back, let your body round and you put your feet up so your toes are level with your eyes. Shaking's allowed, trembling's allowed. Breathe through your nose. Don't try and flatten the back. Let it be rounded. Let it have movement. This is called boat pose. So some boats do capsize. Don't worry about that. <laughs> and, you know, one way to approach it is to frown. You could try that if you want. Good. If you're called Jesse, go lower in the torso. Torso lower, yes. A bit lower, Jesse. Go on, you can do it. <laughs> you can do it. Well done. Okay, bend your knees. Oh, hug your legs. Hug your legs. Lift up and go light in the lumbar. So a bit of rocking around the play. The word lila is a feminine word in Sanskrit, lila. And it's connected with lots of other words like prakriti, which is seen as a sort of dancer. So play is a sort of res listening, responding modality beyond thinking. Mm. Unmani, uh, in Hatha Yoga, the, the word unmani is used beyond thinking. So it's not like getting rid of thinking, it's going beyond thinking. In, in Zen, they sometimes say the thinking beyond thinking. So you have to enter into that through a portal, and that portal is the richness of the moment which we foster by moving left and right and looking for love. So looking for love, not in a sort of thinking-based abstract, what I want, you know, love as in, uh, the main quality of love is that it wants to give. And the main thing that love wants to give is attention. Now, it doesn't matter if it's a person that you love, if it's a place that you love, if it's a new long playing LP record that you love, 33 and a half RPM, you know, it, you want to give it attention, right? Now, attention and absorption make a Venn diagram, if there's enough attention, it's absorption. If everything is committed, is giving, that, that's attention, full attention. Okay, we're going to come into something that a lot of people find very, very uh, happy place, and that's laying down on the back. Yeah. So lay down on your back with your hands <coughs> underneath your head, fingers interlaced. I'll just uh, move the microphone a bit, so I know it makes a noise when I move it. Uh, fingers interlaced, hands under your head as if you're on holiday. <clears throat> Legs bent, it keeps the lower back longer. That helps us to stay in a parasympathetic or move into a parasympathetic response. Uh, there are two kind of responses from the nervous system, sympathetic and parasympathetic. Actually, we want to be very flexible, able to move between those two uh, responses. So most of us are a little sympathetic dominant. That is to say, we get stuck in flight or fight, fight because, well, you know why. All the reasons, because there's traffic, because there's advertising, because there's the, the news, you know, all those things that kind of make us get stuck in flight or fight. So most of us need, <clears throat> at least initially, to be able to move from there to the parasympathetic and having your legs bent, hands under your head, 
helps with that because the lumbar nerves, when they release, that's associated with a parasympathetic rest and digest. It's called release, surrender. One of the things that happens in the parasympathetic is that blood flows more easily. That's simply because when you're in sympathetic dominance, your tissues harden up defensively and that squeezes the blood vessels, making it harder for the blood to circulate, causing in some people high blood pressure. <clears throat> so relaxing, breathing, jaw so. We're gonna flex our hips up. That just means lift the feet. So simple. With bent knees, lift your feet and your lower back will be closer to the floor. So your feet are lifted, your lower back's closer to the floor. <clears throat> Breathe through your nose and feel relaxed enough to let the pose drift any way it wants to investigatively. So sometimes the legs drift apart or sometimes both legs drift to one side or the other. Sometimes they drift closer to the pelvis, sometimes they drift away from the pelvis. The purpose of the drifting, in other words, the purpose of the play is absorption. <laughs> that means it's very much about not so much what you do, but what it's doing for you. So that 1938 classic taint what you do, but the way that you do it, made famous, at least in my generation by the Fun Boy 3 and Banana Rama. <laughs> Super applies here. It's not what you do, but how, the way that you do it. And the way that you do it should be the way that's most absorbing for you. And you know it's absorbing because it feels absorbing. And when you feel absorbed, you feel released, relieved even. Why? Because what you're absorbed into is what we need to know. What we need to know, obviously, is whatever's happening now, because it's the only thing we ever get to deal with. We never get to deal with the future, and we never get to deal with the past, because the past is gone and the future hasn't happened by, very, by definition. But as you range around, you know, any way you want, pausing when, whenever you want. We merge with the interdependence that is reality. The, the reality of the body is not individual muscles like quadratus lumborum, latissimus dorsi, pubococcygeus. Neither is it the nervous system. Neither of it is it the respiratory system. Neither is it psychology, neither is it sociology, but it's all of those together and more. Sociology affects psychology, psychology affects respiration, respiration affects the muscles, the muscles affect the nerves, round and round. Now we're gonna lift our heads up now for a little bit of extra fun, if you think of this as fun, and we're gonna curl ourselves up into a bit of a ball, like a woodlouse. Now, we don't wanna pull on the neck muscles too much, so you can, change your hand position. I quite like to bring my hands to the scalp. The pelvis lifting makes that abdominal imprint even stronger. And I want to emphasize the word imprint, an abdominal imprint. Okay, come down, head down, then feet down. Then everyone takes a deep breath that I can hear. Sigh like exhales, maybe a few, three or four, just like you're sort of really letting go. Trust, giving up, surrender, um, bhakti, which means like devotion. All these are elements in yoga, devotion, surrender, letting go, trust. That's how yoga works. And that's not my opinion. <laughs> that's how we find it in any yoga text, any text that's relevant to yoga, whether it be the Vaisheshika text, the Vaisheshika Sutra, or the Nyaya Sutra, or the Patanjali Yoga Sutra, or whether it be uh, the Mula Majamaka Karika, so many texts that point to the same thing, whether it be the Bhagavad Gita. Release your hands, 
from behind your head. Lift up your feet and plunge through the inside of your legs and hold your big toes. Right? With your index finger, middle finger, and thumb. Right. And then let your head come down. Keep your neck long as it comes down and roll about a bit. In modern postural yoga, in modern versions of modern postural yoga, uh, I've heard people call this, and I think the name originates in California, uh, people calling this the laughing baby, which I think is absolutely fantastic. <laughs> right? It's a completely inaccurate, not completely, a fairly inaccurate translation of the Sanskrit, which is Ananda Balasana. Ananda uh, means bliss, so not laughing, but bliss. <laughs> and Bala just means infant. So really it technically translates as blissful infant, but isn't laughing baby better? <laughs> now babies often lay on their back and they sort of laugh often for no particular reason. Perhaps if you've ever changed a baby's nappy, they're laying on the back, rolling around like this. You have to be careful in case that, you know, suddenly a fountain of wee comes, but you know, they're, they're a bit carefree, isn't it? So we want to be carefree, not quite to the extent of a fountain of wee, but <laughs> there's something, you know, as almost as relaxed, huh? the laughing baby. So roll around, pause if you want to. It's only about absorption. There are no strict instructions about the postures, where postures are even mentioned in yoga texts. The, the instructions are very broad. But we know absorption is part of Shakta yoga. It's part of Patanjala yoga. It's part of Vaishnava yoga. Absorption. So keep playing with it, breathing into it. Letting go. The number one thing is trust. That's why, that's why this Buddhist center is filled with lovely iconography to encourage trust. Whenever you see lovely iconography, nice eyes of a Buddha, kind smile of Tara, it's saying, let go, let go, let go. Okay. Now, speaking of let go, if you want, you can let go of big toes, but you might want to roll around a little longer. You're welcome to. <clears throat> but when you're ready, you can bring your feet down to the floor. Now, we are going to homage uh, a fairly late Hatha text, the Hatha Vyasa Padati, uh, in a sort of adaptation kind of way. We're going to bring our hands behind our head, fingers interlaced. Take a deep breath or two through your nose. Every time you take a deep breath, your diaphragm releases, your psoas releases, the spinal spaces increase. The nerves have less compression. Every time you take a deep breath, it's a lovely way to stretch out and release the diaphragm. Now, the way we're going to homage the, the Hatha Vyasa Padati is to homage one of its postures, if you can call it a posture, Harinasana. Harinasana is the name for the deer posture. And the text tells us to stand up and then jump up and kick our own buttocks with our heels, right? That's the, what, exactly what the text says. There's nothing more than that. And they say, like a deer, Harinasana, kicking your own butt. Now, I think it's a little safer to do it laying on your back. Right? So you can do it now. You can kick your own butt with both heels a few times. Now, the idea of Hatha Yoga, one of the ideas of Hatha Yoga is to begin to get energy to move freely through your energy channels so that it doesn't get stuck, so that it can fall into the central energy channel which is where various texts tell us that the Kundalini exists, life force energy and so on. Now, uh, the text doesn't, here's an adaptation. You can now kick your buttocks alternate feet. Huh? So back and forth. So again, we're uh, thinking of that porridge being stirred. The pot of porridge is the sort of energy habits we have. 
And if you kind of shake them up a little bit, we all know <clears throat> that some of those knots go, we feel much more flowing. When you feel flowing, you fall into the center. Falling into the center of things. As David Bowie once said on his album, Aladdin saying, lift up your head while you're kicking your ass. Someone's got to kick your ass, so might as well be you. <laughs> Breathe into it. <laughs> you have done always a tongue. This is like, a, it's not called tantrum baby, but it could be, couldn't it? And breathe into it. So we're just stirring up energy. Okay, slowly let your head come down. That's eccentric contraction of the abdominals. Slowly let your legs slow down. And finally, place your feet on the floor. And I want to hear everyone take a deep breath in with a sigh like exhale. Hmm. And maybe another will follow, and another will follow. And the more of these breaths that happen, the more we're in flow. <clears throat> the first ever text on Hatha Yoga says, you can't adjust your mind with your mind. You have to adjust your mind with your breath. So let your breath flow. And then the mind will flow. When the mind is flowing, it means you're not interfering with it. When you're not interfering with it, it means you recognize it as not self, as the Buddha would call it, anatta. Yeah. Anatta means not self in Pali. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anatman is the, the Sanskrit. Release your hands from behind your head, roll over. To face towards the Buddha side of the room. If you're in the room, I mean, you're in the room if you're on Zoom as well, but you sort of, you might be facing different directions. Bend the leg you're laying on. 90 degrees, two sets of 90 degrees, one between the calf and the thigh, and the other between the thigh and the tummy. Two sets of 90 degrees. Now, for various reasons, I didn't study very hard at school. <laughs> but I did learn 90 degrees. So if I came away from school knowing 90 degrees, you should at least know that much too. <laughs> various reasons, I won't go into them now. Anyway. Lightly tongue in the tummy, extend the inner groin, and stretch the leg back. I went to Downland's Comprehensive in Hassocks, by the way. It's much better school now than it was in the 1980s. I should just say that. Toe in the tummy, push, lift, turn. Elbows, forearms and wrists on the floor. The elbows forwards of the shoulders. <clears throat> so in Vajrasati Yoga, this is a Vajrasati Yoga class, by the way. In Vajrasati Yoga, now, this is called Shayana Marichasana. Shayana means resting. Maricha, or Marichi, sorry, is the name of a sage that appears in many texts. Because it's yoga, let's use our three pointers. Play, for the purpose of absorption. <laughs> And look for signs of absorption, like feeling relaxed even when groups of lads go past. <laughs> Jaw soft, eyes soft, deep breath, playing. <laughs> so the movement is your way of tuning in, like an old fashioned radio dial. She used to tune in. They've started early, haven't they? Top leg on top of the bottom leg, curl up from the side. Well done. And then still face towards the Buddha, but bring your feet to the other end of your mat. Okay, bend the leg you're laying on. So you've got two sets of 90 degrees, one between your thigh and tummy, and one between your calf and your thigh. <clears throat> so the iliacus and psoas both insert in the inner groin and go across the lateral pubis, the psoas going further into the sides of the lower spine. Anyway, that muscular area, if you lift your leg, <clears throat> we can stretch it, but obviously tissue stretches best if it's soft, if it's pliant. Yeah? So what happens is the mind and the body are the same. If you're tense in your mind, you're tense in the body. So use that information, soften your attitude, so you're enjoying 
It's lovely soft sunlight this morning. There's a soft breeze coming in through the door. Your breath mirrors your mind. So breathe in a way that feels surrendered. And surrender brings about communion. <clears throat> that is to say, union between body, brain, breath, everything else. Eventually the foot will land, but with that soft, psychophysical, psychophysical softness maintained, reiterated in the groin. So the foot lands eventually, and then you suck in your tummy, you push down, lift and turn, and you come to your elbows, forearms and wrists. <clears throat> Breathing through the nose. The elbows should be a little further forwards than the shoulders so that the chest is pulled forwards. That keeps the psoas long and the latissimus dorsi long and the quadratus lumborum long. It's just, that's just information. <clears throat> the elbow shouldn't be wider than the shoulder width, otherwise you drop down too low. And similarly, you lose length from the muscles I've just mentioned. <clears throat> Fascia refers to connective tissue that includes superficial fascia, deep fascia, visceral fascia, meningeal fascia. <clears throat> and, but fascia doesn't differentiate itself into those categories. <laughs> Humans do that. <clears throat> superficial fascia merges with myofascia. Superficial fascia is the fascia that holds the fat cells near the skin, but it merges with the fascia that makes up the muscles. Muscles are muscle cells, but how are they held together? Well, by fascia. First of all in strands, and then in bundles, and spindles, and eventually in muscles. So as you move, feel the interdependence, and know that movement will help melt tension in the fascia, make it more fluid. That allows better blood flow, makes it easier to breathe. Top leg on top of the bottom leg and just curl up and straight onto your hands and knees, please. <clears throat> straight onto your hands and knees and just have a look at your hands and make sure they're equidistant from the sides and the front of the mat. Like really check as if it mattered. Imagine for a minute that a yoga teacher was in the room and they were just about to get up and check that your hands were equidistant from the sides of the mat. Oh, it's happened. So <laughs> have a look, check that your little fingers are exactly the same distance from the side of the mat as each other and spread your fingers too. Make sure you have, your fingers are the same distance from the front of the mat as each other. Notice if you feel a bit tense when I walk around and hold your breath a bit, that's good. That's as it should be. You should feel incredibly tense when I walk around. Okay, good, you did well. Now tuck your toes under and lift up your bum. Now imagine that very same yoga teacher was still walking around and now was checking that your feet were equidistant from the side of the mat. Tremendous pressure building up on us as he walks past inspecting us. <laughs> but it's so much better if we see for ourselves and check for ourselves. Now it doesn't, I won't say it doesn't matter, but there's lots of different variations you can take. You can have your feet very wide, very narrow, hands very wide or very narrow. But what matters is that the hands are the same distance from the side of the mat as each other and the feet are. And you breathe into it. I'd go wider with my feet, Norma, if I were you and turn the heels out. Good. Good. Jimmy, I'd take my hands a bit wider if I were you. Yeah. Good. Good. And then extend the armpits. Breathe easy. Turn your heels out a little. <laughs> Breathe through your nose. <laughs> now, take the shoulders forward so they come above the wrists. So again, we're back in Palankasana, also known as Kumbhakasana. We did it earlier. We, we loved it. So I could tell how much you loved it. So I thought I'd do it again. <laughs> to be a crowd pleaser, that's what I am, a crowd pleaser. Breathe easy. Now we're gonna lower both knees slowly. Know that you're loved, you're loved. Okay, and just touch the floor very, very, very lightly. Some of you are doing it too heavily, very lightly. If you've got nylon trousers, just so you can feel the static from your trousers. And then lift up again. 
your knees, okay? If your tummy's trembling, don't worry about it. Try moving a bit to share the load. Now one knee at a time, very, very, very lightly. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Oh God, Jim, I sort of like you, but sort of not, Jim. And then the other knee, very lightly. Good. And then knees forwards and sit up in a kneeling position and catch your breath. If that's strong on your wrists, don't worry. There you go, that's good advice. Isn't it? <laughs> Why would I say don't worry? Well, the wrists get stronger through weight bearing. That's one thing to say. The wrists also get more mobile. You get more fluidity by stretching them. It increases the heat. It melts down, uh, down some extraneous myofascia. So even though things are tough sometimes, they're often really good for you. <laughs> now there's the context laid out for you. We're going to now bring blocks behind us. If you've got cork blocks, they're preferable. I'm gonna use purple blocks, but there are more cork blocks in the room. So uh, those of you, us that can have cork, we will. Uh, otherwise we'll have the regular blocks. Uh, fine either way, but cork are a bit firmer. So I'll bring some cork cork ones out. We'll see how many of you can have cork ones. You get to because you're having to suffer me pushing you into your place. <laughs> Good. Two cork blocks if possible. Here's the more cork blocks over here. These are available. Uh, but otherwise we can use the other blocks and of course the same at home. At home you can also use books as long as the books are of the same height and the binding faces forwards. Still two more cork blocks uh, available. So there we go. That's the end of the cork blocks that are in the room. Some of you have got cork blocks, some of you haven't. I haven't, and it's okay. Don't worry. But if you have, they go where my purple blocks are, and they should be level. I'm just going to check mine are level. If anybody is neurotic by nature, now's your time to really go for it. <laughs> okay. Okay. So we're celebrating neurosis in this class. We're not condemning it, we're celebrating it. <laughs> Hands come on the blocks, fingers facing forwards. Great. The main thing I want to say to you is, bring the chest and head together. So any movement of one is the movement of the other. For, for example, when your chest moves up, your head moves back. When your head moves back, your chest moves up. So just practice this movement, the two moving together and then moving back down again together. Do it three times. So you feel that they're completely married. The movement of one is the movement of the other. People get issues in these kind of poses when the chest stays still, but they tip the head back. That, that makes you feel horrible for good reason. But if you move your chest and head together, that's a wonderful thing. It does take commitment to the present and many of us are subconsciously addicted instead of uh, to the present, to our stories. Bend your legs, place your feet. So they're on the floor. The blocks are about the width of a block behind the bum. Tummy is toned, it's drawn in like that. You draw it in and you lift your chest up and start moving the chest and head together as you raise the pelvis. Commit fully. Breathe into it, commit fully. Chest moves with the head. The issue we have, of course, is commitment to the present. Many of us think subconsciously it's more important to run our stories than to open up to the present, but trust and give, really commit. Even if you're afraid, be brave. Chest tips over with the head. That's how the head is protected. You can move around on the four points of contact. Okay, come down. I feel people are coming down anyway, so I should go with the flow. Cross your <laughs> Cross the legs, draw the buttock flesh out and back. The best position, I think, after that pose is Sukhasana. This is the position we're in. Okay. Take a few deep breaths and just let yourself kind of recover. So deep breaths. It's quite a challenge for many of us, that posture. Take a few deep breaths. <laughs> so in the tantric traditions, there's a saying that says you can use a thorn to remove a thorn. Huh? 
earlier traditions, like the Sutra tradition in Buddhism, describes the Buddha saying, you can, like a skilled carpenter, we use a piece of wood to knock another piece of wood out. So it's a similar thing. Or you use an imprint to remove another imprint. In other words, our nervous system is filled with imprints, stories that have a physical correlate, stories about ourselves, about our pasts, about our futures. And you need something strong to press into it, into the body-mind, to challenge what it's holding. So we're using a thorn to remove a thorn. We're using a piece of wood to remove another piece of wood. We're using an imprint to remove an imprint. Anyway, that's a bit of a sort of sales pitch for a strong pose. Okay. So you're gonna put your blocks in front of you. Uh, if you've got a blanket, put that down. It makes it more comfy. Put a blanket down. In fact, just put a blanket. If you haven't got one, I'll bring you one. At home, of course, put a blanket down. I know you've got blankets at home. If you haven't got blankets, you can use whatever. You've got something to put down. Not a, not a quilt, though, but a blanket. And just lay it down on your mat so it covers most of your mat. Right. Like what Norma's done. Norma's done the right thing. Again, it's always doing the right thing, Norma. Passing them out. There's love in the room. People are passing them out. So you've got blocks ahead of you. You're going to lay on your tummy on your blanket with the blocks out in front of you. They can be cork blocks if you've got them. Purple blocks otherwise. Purple blocks is not, I'm not doing an advert for that company that sells houses. Purple. Oh, purple bricks, that's it. In fact, I sold my flat that I lived in before through purple bricks. And uh, they were very good, actually. But I'm not, I'm not getting sponsored by them, but... Uh, if anyone knows of them and knows that they can tell them that I said this, I'm very happy to receive any recuperation from them. So <laughs> laying on your tummy and up on your elbows and take a breath or two. So we've got this extra support for the pubis. So hopefully that means you can feel a bit freer to move left and move right. And we're not just moving left and moving right while thinking of the past and the future. We're moving left and moving right to really increase our sensation. So I mentioned there are about 10 formulae that I've come up with over the last 30 years of teaching yoga. And I know it's hard to believe I've been teaching that long with this wonderful young looking face. But anyway, <laughs> and one of them, I've mentioned play, purpose and signs. And I mentioned calmness, con conditions, uh, connection. But when we move like this, moving left, moving right, really, really stretching, we make this imprint into the nervous system that then releases its stories and makes us lighter. At the beginning, I talked about a dandelion seed, that we should be light like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is the metaphor of the two stepping stones. There's a river with two banks. One, everything you experience is independent. You and me, right and wrong, good and bad, success and failure, gain and loss. That's the realm of suffering. <laughs> Dukas, uh, manasaha. The other realm is interdependent. Now, through movement, you create rich sensations, right? So that's what we're doing, stretching your tummy, making it rich, making it feel like a rich experience. That's the first stepping stone, a rich experience. The second stepping stone is breathing into that, giving to that. Find a rich experience and give to it. Then the rich experience becomes a portal to take you across, to take you through to the other shore. Two stepping stones. <coughs> Stretch the legs back as well. We're stretching the psoas in two directions, forwards with the tummy, backwards with the legs. Now I could keep doing that for ages, I find it very beneficial. But we're gonna bring our arms forwards onto our brick blocks. And obviously there are several heights, you've got different height options for your blocks, different directional options. 
for me, I'm going to go for the highest setting because um, that suits me. But see what you feel. Breathe through your nose. The legs don't have to be together, but they shouldn't be too wide apart. Notice if you're squeezing your buttocks together and, and stop it. Okay. So <laughs> notice if you're squeezing your buttocks together and, and stop it. Because if you squeeze the buttocks together, you close the central channel. The central channel is what it sounds like, a channel central in the body, immediately in front of the spinal column. So feel into that channel. Don't squeeze the buttocks together. Don't turn the heels in. And if you want, there's the option to raise the legs, but don't squeeze the buttocks together. Raise the legs if you want. Breathe into it. If it's strong in your back muscles, good. Because right? most people's back muscles are a little atrophy. Okay, release your hands from the blocks. Place one hand on top of the other and rest your head. Legs down, head down, breathe. Hmm. Let's hear some deep breaths. Hmm. Good, pop up onto your elbows and forearms. And stretch the tummy again. <clears throat> From a sort of practical point of view, we're hydrating myofascia, we're melting extraneous myofascia, we're bringing increased fluidity through heat into myofascia. So that's from a practical point of view. Stretch your legs back and tummy forwards. See if you can feel that there's something deep in the body that's getting longer, more open, less tense. Right? That's the psoas. Once you've got maximum length, and it really makes a difference to prepare like this, so stretch a bit more, stretch your legs back again, right? To, to extend the inner groins. Stretch your tummy forwards again, from the left, the right. Do both of those a few more times until you feel you've made space between those two points. The muscle that runs between those two points is long. Once that's all nice and long, then we're gonna reach back one leg at a time or both together and take hold of the shins, ankles, or feet. Shins if you can. Okay, well done, well done. Good job, good job. Now that's enough, isn't it? You don't need me to tell you that's enough. It's clearly enough. But if you if want, if you feel like it, you can lift your chest and legs up as well. You don't have to, but you can if you want. But it's enough doing what you're doing. Breathe through your nose. If you are lifting up, Push your shins or ankles back into your hands and pull your hands forwards against the ankles. Get a checkmate between the legs and the hands. And then use that checkmate to drive energy into the back body and lift up the front body. <laughs> okay, <laughs> come down. Rest one hand on top of the other. Take a deep breath. If your back feels a bit tight after that, honestly, don't worry. <laughs> It's just muscles that you're not used to using. But let's take deep breaths now. Let, let the breath be really expressive. Yeah. If your back aches a bit, don't worry a single bit about it. There's literally nothing you have to do about it. It's just muscles. Observe the buttocks releasing. We've used a thorn to remove a thorn. We've used a piece of wood to knock out another piece of wood. We've used an imprint to release another imprint. Huh? Once while on, this is a sort of holiday forward slash retreat in Brecon Beacons. I went for a walk wearing Wellington boots on a muddy day in the, in the Brecon Beacons. And there was a muddy puddle there and I couldn't resist putting my foot in the mud with the boot on and pressing down and 
as I pressed my boots down, bubbles came up out of the mud. I made an imprint and what the mud was holding as a result came up and out, it released. So it's the same thing. Taking deep breaths. Good job, okay. Now, I hope you can move. Otherwise, I don't know how we're gonna cope with the meditation class afterwards. People will have to sit on you, I suppose. But I hope you can move and roll over onto your side. You might feel a little sort of bashed up in a good way. And then you come up from the side, curl up all calm and collected. Now we're gonna sit on one to two blocks. If you're on two blocks, you don't need this blanket by the way. If you're on two blocks, you need uh, another block behind you. So for example, uh, if you had two blocks like that, you'd have a brick block behind you. We're gonna minimally sit on one. So I'm gonna sit on one. Some of you will need to sit on two if your legs feel they need more space or if you know uh, you need more space. And then simply both legs are gonna come over to one side of the pelvis. If you're here in the, if you're a roomer in the room, then your legs go towards that side of the room. <laughs> that side. That's it. So just, uh, just to, cause some of you've got the, yeah. There you go. I try to do it tactfully so no one really gradually sinks in. <laughs> Good. Now, Bhardhvajasana is the name of the pose. Both legs over that way, Simon. So you want to stretch your legs out yeah, and then go that way. Yeah. It's okay. You're in good company. About a third of the class brought their legs the wrong way. Yeah, but I love you, boy. That's what I like about you. Now, the lower shin goes into the foot heart. <laughs> I like that. I think most people that come to yoga are a bit back to front. That's why we like them. You know, it's breach birth as well. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Started from the beginning. <laughs> Your top foot points straight back. So Norma, that top foot, if you can turn. Yeah, you go. That's it. Just tidy it up a bit. <laughs> now the back leg, that's the one nearest your feet. That stays heavy. So you can rub it or pat it. Just encourage it to relax and release. You know, rub, pat. So it just feels a bit more easy and it's not tense. And then we're gonna bring our hand onto that released leg with the thumb following the line from the inner to the outer groin. So there's a line there. Press out and down, that's it. And release, do it a few times, out and down. Towards the top of the outer thigh bone, you will feel there's a point where you get it just right after several attempts. And it feels like, ah, oh, it's a sort of release that comes with a lifting feeling. Lift when you're ready and turn, keep your hand in position and breathe. So your hand is reminding your leg not to lift. It's reminding your leg not to tense. Breathe through your nose. Keep your eyes soft. So it's quite a discipline because most of us are conditioned to do what's called reaching out, upadana. The literal translation of the word upadana is fuel, but it's normally translated as reaching out, like grasping for the next thing. Some people call it monkey mind, where the mind is like a monkey and it won't stop swinging to the next branch. <laughs> So most of us have that, and this acts as a sort of uh, anchor. It sort of calms the monkey minds down a bit. So if you feel that sort of tendency, that restlessness to reach out, just let this hold you back. Now the back hand that's on the floor or the block can reach all the way round in some cases and hold on to the wrist of the hand that's on your thigh. You got it. That's it. So it can reach around and hold onto the wrist. But it doesn't have to. You can keep it on the floor if that's more comfortable. Okay. Let that back leg settle. Notice the monkey mind. Let it go through the breath. There are further options. 
uh, and there are options, including letting the hand that's on the thigh, letting that arm slip through the other hand so the hand comes further up towards the bicep, you end up with your hand coming to the inner thigh like that. That's an option. You don't have to do it, you can stay like this, or you can move around. And another option is to bring your hand even further up and bring your hand onto the outside of the other leg. But you still need the discipline of not lifting the back leg. So if you're someone who feels like a sort of perpetual wild horse, sort of always ready to jump the gun, <laughs> This is the therapy. Let it settle. Okay. Release, return to center. Well done. Stretch out your legs. Beautifully done, everyone. Give yourself an energy bath. What is an energy bath? It's a bath. But without water so give yourself a proper rub down and in any good bath you make sure you do everywhere right you don't forget the armpits for example <laughs> you don't forget behind the ears you don't forget your face you want a, a proper bath I, I can't be quite as thorough as i'd like to be because i've got a microphone and it it's quite noisy but if you don't if you're not currently wearing a microphone give yourself a good rub over everywhere and it should feel Vitalizing, which is what we want. And then once you feel vitalized, then the legs go to side two. Same thing as before, and that's this side. And the upper leg shin, lower shin goes into the foot arch of the bottom foot. And you lift and shift until that's more comfortable for you. The knees are a little way apart. Breathing through your nose. Yeah, yeah, your feet want to go that way this time. Yeah. Good job, great. Breathe easy. Again, there's this tendency for tightness in the back leg, right? So give it a rub or a pat or whatever. I've seen people do various sort of movements. It's about what's effective. It doesn't matter what it looks like. You know, is it better to pat? I saw one girl once doing loads of little karate chops like that. I thought that was pretty good. You know, it's about what's effective, about release, release, release of the bone through the flesh the bone really, the heaviness of the femur down. So once that's heavy, the mind, remember, and the body are the same thing. So the relaxed bone will have a correlate in the mind. Then we place our hand there for further iteration, further reiteration of the pressing down and out. So inner groin, outer groin, we're pressing along that line towards the top of the outer thigh bone where it articulates with the pelvis. For me, I have to do it lots of times because I tend to get it wrong. Uh, I either press too hard or too gentle uh, until I, so I have to tune in, which is not a thought. I have to tune in and it's, it's, it's confirmed not by my thinking, but by my breathing, by your breathing. Once you feel some sort of breath confirmed release, then lift and turn. And breathe through your nose with soft eyes. Remember your mind and your body are the same thing. So if you want a relaxed back leg, you've got to have a relaxed mind. Again, there's the option to bring your back hand round and hold the wrist. It's not suitable for everyone. Some people have got longer arms than others. So. Great stretch for the chest. Breathe through your nose, keep your eyes relaxed. Further options include sliding the arm through the hand, and so the hand ends up higher up on the arm, the hand ends up on the inner thigh, or even higher up still, and then bringing the arm to the outer leg. Aparigraha, empty of grasping. I'm not saying that you're empty of grasping or that I'm empty of grasping. Personally, I feel like I'm jam-packed, filled with it. 
but it's about uncoupling from that grasping. When the grasping kicks in, we don't feel compelled to go with it. Deep breaths, soft eyes, soft brain. Okay, slow and easy, release and return to center. Stretch out, give yourself a very thorough energy bar for the Vyana value, the all over energy. So it should be all over, it's all over energy. It should be vigorous. I quite like it being vigorous myself. I feel like that's the best way to really vitalize it. You know, and you should feel kind of zingy afterwards, kind of zingy afterwards. And we're going to sit in any comfortable cross leg position or kneeling. Uh, now, I'm going to sit using uh, two regular yoga blocks, short end facing forwards. But if you've got a cork block, sit on that. Uh, if you're comfortable, that is, to sit in this pose called Siddhasana. Siddhasana. Uh, there are very uh, many variations of Siddhasana. The cork block is the best thing to sit on unless you're very, very, very bony in the bottom. I've only ever exempted one person uh, from sitting on cork blocks because, and this is not my opinion, but her opinion, her bum is way too bony. <laughs> so um, that's Leo Taylor, by the way, that I've exempted <laughs> <laughs> sitting on a block. <laughs> Some of you have met Leo. But don't, you know, overlook at her buttocks now. Are they that bony, as she said? Anyway. <laughs> Lovely Leo. Heels lined up with each other and with the midline of the body and the chest point, Siddhasana. Heels lined up with each other and with the midline of the body. I'm going to do one long chant of the Bija Mantra Hreem. If you don't know what Hreem looks like, uh, if you ever go to the class with the marvelous uh, yoga teacher, Kadeen Morkham, she has a Hreem tattooed on her uh, upper uh, back and top of uh, bottom of the neck so you can see what cream looks like in Sanskrit but it's the Bija mantra for all the goddesses collectively and the goddess represents an experience of the interdependent which is something you rest into you relax into because it's real the body is connected to the brain the brain is connected to the breath the breath is connected to our uh, attitudes. Our attitudes are connected to our society. Our society is connected to uh, the planet. So cream, and we're going to imagine that we're placing this cream in the heart. Normally with beaches, they are placed into the body somewhere. Here we're going to place it. The word is nyasa, place, in the heart. So let's do it together. Hands come to the heart, preposition. We're going to do a long, deep inhale, followed by cream for the exhale. Inhale. Cream. And then a deep breath in, followed by, you know what, deep breath out. <laughs> And then another deep breath will come by itself. And a few of them will just roll through you. It's just nice to sort of feel like, oh, it's just the breath's rolling through. You know, it's like just rolling through. So the body has become available. <laughs> To respond to the moment, which is the goddess. The goddess has powers, uh, shaktis, they're called, the power to know, act, and to will, to want to act. So this all boils down to uh, subjective uh, intuition and spontaneity. <laughs> and we're going to lay down on our backs. Uh, I'll say unfortunately, not because laying down on your back is unfortunate, because it indicates the end of the class, and I don't want it to end. 
So I'm enjoying myself. But anyway, you might have other things to get on with. And we're going to lay down on our back. Also, there is a meditation class following this one, which I highly recommend to you. It's open to the general public. We're going to lay down for a pose that's so important that in the third, maybe fourth, text ever written on Hatha Yoga, it's one of the only four techniques that are mentioned. <coughs> Other techniques include focusing on the vacuity in the central channel and observing the point between the eyebrows. And then there's this, Shavasana. It's important to lay yourself down symmetrically and spaciously. It's important that if your head tips back that you put something underneath your head. Your hands should be clear of the mat, quite a long way clear of the mat. And your shoulder blades scooted under the body so your chest is buoyant. We should have a mild Jalandhara Vanda, that is to say the chest and chin should be orientated subtly towards each other. The eyes are closed. The text in question, the Dattatreya Yoga Shastra, says this. Find a place that you can be on your own. It says a lonely place, a place you can be on your own, not disturbed. And lay on your back as if you were dead with your mouth facing towards the sky. As if you were dead. So that's putting down all your burdens and responsibilities and ideas of self. The text tells us further that our limbs should be loose, completely loose. Arms, heavy. Legs, completely released. And the head feeling the full weight totally released into the floor. The text tells us that the purpose of what we're doing is laya yoga, L-A-Y-A, absorption yoga, melting yoga, dissolution yoga. The particle returning to the field. The independent returning to the interdependent. Any sensation anywhere is a particle that you can trace back to its source, the field. Even the tingling sensations in the big toe of your right or left foot. Feel into those sensations and eventually you'll feel into the field that everything's ultimately part of.
Allow a little movement of your toes. A little movement of the ankles. A little movement of the wrists, fingers. And eventually let those movements migrate into stretches. And eventually let those stretches lead to you feeling ready to bend your legs and place the feet onto the floor. Scoot the buttocks under once you've done that and then take a deep breath in and a deep breath out to let the lower back release entirely into the breath. Roll onto your side when you're ready, facing away from this side of the room and laying as comfortably as you can on your side. Knees drawn up, tummy skin soft. When you feel ready, roll over again. And again, lay as comfortably as you can on your side. Start to let a bit of light and color and sound and sensation filter gently into your eyes. And let some organic stretches take place, such as rubbing a hand through your hair or stretching out your arms or your legs. And eventually when you feel ready to come up, bring yourself up nice and easy from the side using your arms to assist your ascent. Thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate it. So great to see you. Thank you. I'm back out in the world. Thank you. Thank you for Tara being here and blessing us with her blessing energy. Uh, there is a, a meditation class coming in this very room that's open to the general public with marvellous Sri Pada, who's just one of the most lovely people you're ever going to meet. Uh, so if you want to do that uh, this week or any week, you can come. It's just a donation downstairs, and it's a really nice thing to do, and I think it's an hour and a half. There are three meditations that are guided. They're simple. It's made to bhavna, usually, which is loving kindness, uh, anapanasati, mindfulness of breathing, and then a walking meditation. It's very easy. And then Sri Pada saying nice things about life. It's always nice. Thank you again, gang. Really lovely to see you. Thank you for coming home. Thanks, Sumas. Thank you. Wow. I didn't realize my video was on. Good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.